You know, when Paul, Apostle Paul, who is one of the greatest apostles that ever lived, was called by God in Acts chapter 9 and verse 15, God says to Ananias this about Paul, Go for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Hmm, I like to hear that. God's chosen vessel. To bear my name before Gentiles. That's awesome. Kings. I like that. The children of Israel. I don't like that so much, but I'll take that. The Gentiles, the kings, the children of Israel. I mean, we talk about worldwide ministry. Worldwide international LOC. I mean, incredible ministry that Paul is going to have. And then there's verse 16. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Uh, can I take that back? Lord, could you just leave at kings, Gentiles, and the children of Israel? I want to share something with you. The power of God, the purity, and the purpose of God in our life requires us to have perseverance if we are to have a great calling in our life. Great calling requires a great cost. The cost is not always sleepless nights of you praying. The cost is not always, oh, there's just going to be so many challenges because of, of a ministry that I'm going to do. A lot of times the cost that most people are not prepared for when they go into ministry or serving God is this. You will not be liked. You, you will be persecuted. You will be harassed, name called and rejected by people that you love so much like your family. And it hurts the most when it's your family. It hurts the most when it's your co-workers and your friends because you became a Christian. As long as you were a lukewarm, complacent Christian, you were fine, you were liked. But now that you became radical, now that you became born again, now that your life is changed, now that you have a calling, with that calling comes persecution. This is not to say that you walk around constantly expecting to be a punching bag. But it simply means that if you have a calling, you also have to have a perseverance. So number one, persecution is the price for walking in power. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Paul tells a young minister. Jesus tells people who sacrificed for him and for his kingdom. And he says there is going to be a reward for you, Mark 10.30. Who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. So Jesus says there will be a hundredfold in this time. Houses, brothers, sisters, mothers and children. I want you to notice it doesn't say wives. So everything will be multiplied except your wife. Your wife stays the same. Children and lands. With persecutions. And in the age to come eternal life. So Jesus says to his followers, his disciples, his apostles who said, Jesus, we gave our life for you. We sacrificed our businesses for you. And Jesus says, I want to let you know. You will get a hundredfold. You will get everything back. Even in this life, I will bless you. I'll give you so many brothers. I'll give you so many sisters. I'm going I'm to give you so many like physical and even spiritual children. You'll have lands, meaning there's going to be territory you will be taking for the kingdom of God. He says, there's going to be great things I'm going to do in your life. And he adds this word there. You're like, Jesus, do you really have to like spoil this whole thing? With persecution. We don't like the with part. But you cannot have a great purpose if you don't have perseverance to deal with the haters, with those who will attack you, undermine you, falsely accuse you. This happened to, to Abel when God favored his sacrifice. His own brother took his life. This happened to Joseph when God favored his life. His brothers, they rejected him. Somebody lied about him and threw him in jail. This happened to Jeremiah. He got thrown into the pit. This happened to other prophets. Some of them got sought in the house. This happened for many, many, many people throughout the Bible. This happened to Jesus. This happened to his 12 followers. If you read their story, a lot of them, one of them got skinned alive. One of them got speared. The other guy got thrown from the pinnacle of the temple. And then if that wasn't enough, they came and punched him to death. So you read the story of the early Christians. You're like, man, they had such a great impact on the society, but they also endured some pretty heavy things. You're like, yeah, but I'm so glad I live in America. This doesn't happen in America. Try to be a real Christian and you'll see this happens here too. It could start in your family. It can start in the place of business. It could start in the place of your neighborhood and your work where some people will just kind of maybe respectfully but kind of think you're weird, start spreading stories about you. 
And you have to learn to endure that. The second thing that I want to highlight and that is not experiencing persecution is an exception, not a promise. Which means if we are the people who somehow avoid persecution, we live for Jesus, prosperity, wealth and health, it's not something God promised. It's just a blessed exception and it's not something that's permanent. John Wesley who was a powerful revivalist, he would be persecuted for his preachings all the time and in his time they would throw rocks at him. So he'll be preaching in open air meetings and as he's preaching just somebody throws a rock at him and it was pretty common until it didn't happen for three days. He got pretty concerned. He got on his knees before God and he said, Lord, have I backslidden? Lord, is there a hidden sin in my life? No stones have been thrown in my face three days. And as he is there repenting, somebody throws a brick. So he says, thank you, Jesus. We're all right now. And I'm reading that story and I was like, John, you crazy. I'll be doubting God's presence if somebody's throwing stones at me. I won't be doubting God's presence because I'm not experiencing persecution. See, most of us Westerns, we, we are conditioned in such a way. We even, like if you listen to our rhetoric on the stage, everything about Jesus is this. It's, it's, it's me-centered gospel. Everything is about me and if it costs me anything, it's definitely not God. It's definitely not God. But the old timers and those of you who grew up in that Christian faith that you know when you're passing the children, the faith to your children right now, you knew that it's okay to suffer for Jesus some persecution because this is the most of hell you'll experience on this earth, most of hardship you'll experience. Heaven is in heaven. We're not trying to get two heavens, one here and one there. We have one heaven. Even our Savior didn't have two heavens. He didn't have a heaven here. He had a hardships here, but He is bringing us to heaven there. And if we are experiencing a little bit of heaven, we are grateful, but please understand, it is not a promise to live a life without persecution. It is a blessed, blessed exception, not a promise. So if they come, embrace them. If they don't come, make sure you're not compromising and make sure you're not a spiritual undercover. Number three, persecution weeds out compromising Christians. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13 verse 20 through 21, but he who received the seed on the stony soil or stony places is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. When tribulation or persecution arises because of the word immediately he stumbles. See, persecution has a purifying effect on your soul. Because while it hurts, it also purifies. While it hurts, it also exposes certain things. It's interesting, in the book of Revelation, out of seven churches, two persecuted churches were never rebuked for anything. They were commended for everything. And the churches that were not persecuted had problems that Jesus rebuked. Because something happens when you go through persecution. It exposes things in you and causes you to deal with those things with God. It purifies you. I am not saying that we all need persecution for that reason. But what I'm saying is that God is able to use that to bring a purifying thing about our life. But the same persecution exposes the weakness of our faith and causes many Christians to tap out and say, I don't want to believe in God if that's the case. I heard this uh, in a sermon from one of the pastors who, were, who was sitting in jail under the Soviet regime. And one time... Uh, two or three KGB agents walked in, grabbed the microphone and they told to the church, if you're ready for die, to die for Jesus, stay. If you're not ready to die for Jesus and you want to renounce Jesus, we will count to five and you need to leave. And thus you can save your life. Think about your families, think about your job and think about your future. If you want to die, you stay. If you do not want to die today and you're willing to renounce Jesus, you're free and we're going to count to five. They started to count. One, two, three, four, five. So half of the church got up and left. The KGB guys closed the doors, hand the microphone back to the pastor and they said, Pastor, now you can preach. All the fakes are gone. <laughs> so, persecution exposes. I'm not saying persecution makes you lose your faith. Sometimes people come up like, man, because of all the hardships I've endured, I lost my faith. And respectfully, I want to say, you didn't have any of it. 
the hardships exposed that what you had was hype, positive thinking, and not faith. Because faith is compared to a gold. Gold is never destroyed by fire. It's only made pure by fire. You know what destroys? What fire destroys? Paper. It doesn't destroy gold. The Bible doesn't call my faith paper. It calls it gold. Genuine faith in the crucified Messiah who died for my sin, who was buried and rose from the dead and is coming back and His kingdom lives inside of me by the power of the Holy Spirit. That faith you can't break. That faith you can't destroy. That faith you can burn my body. You can destroy my career. You can destroy my reputation. That faith I know in who I believe. I know in who I have believed. I know my Redeemer lives, Job said. That faith, my friend, is purified by fire. It is not destroyed by fire. So that little flimsy, wobbly, you know, like, oh, I just, just felt something. I don't know if it's God energy or Mother Earth touched me. I just felt the energy when I came here. Oh, I cried a tear because my boyfriend broke my heart yesterday. So I ran to Jesus so he can heal my heart so I can go to the next boyfriend tomorrow and break my heart again. That faith is destroyed. But faith in the crucified, resurrected soon coming King. In the Gospel, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the Gospel. It is the power of God, my friend. That faith, not faith in faith, not faith in you, faith in Him is purified. Put me through the fire, I'll come out as gold. Put me through the water, I'll come out washed. Put me through persecution, I'll come out purged. Why? Because you can kill something that you didn't create. Only God created that faith. And persecution only purifies it. That's why James and Peter says, though your faith being purified like gold. So people who say that I lost my faith, I'm not saying that you didn't have it. What I'm saying is genuine faith, genuine faith is purified, not destroyed. If you lost all of it, Sometimes I've noticed about young people, they didn't lose the faith. They lost the feeling of their faith. They're not feeling it anymore. But faith isn't a feeling. Faith is knowing. He loves me. He died for me. I don't feel good. That's why I'm not a concern about losing the feeling of God. As long as I don't lose the fear of God. The feelings come and go. The fear of the Lord. The trust in God. Through hard times and good times. That is what matters. Can somebody say amen? Faith, persecution weeds out compromising Christians. It exposes us as Christians who have compromises in our life that we need to repent of. Martin Luther said, if the devil were wise enough, he would stand by in silence and let the gospel be preached. He would suffer less harm. For, there, for when there is no battle for the gospel, it rusts and it finds no cause and no occasion to show its vigor and power. Therefore, nothing better can befall the gospel than the world should fight it with force and cunning. In other words, the gospel is not afraid of persecution. The gospel can withstand beating, jail, censorship, being cancelled. Every regime has tried to stop the gospel. We read about those regimes in our history books. The gospel is still marching forth. Lives are still being changed. Lives are still being transformed. Number four, suffering for stupid decisions is not persecution. Now let's balance things out because hearing anything on persecution what begins to happen is this. You got your house repossessed or you got your car taken away. Oh, I'm being persecuted. Not really. You didn't make payments. Got lost your job because you have not been faithful at your job. <laughs> you know, there's just been such a persecution that came against me. Uh, no, you're lazy. You're not punctual. We got to be very careful that we don't take scriptures out of context and put ourselves in every situation justifying our laziness, compromise or sin as a persecution. Where sometimes it's not a persecution, it's simply compromise and sin that we need to repent of. Think of this. 
Joseph walks in purity, he ends up in prison. That's persecution for righteousness sake. Samson runs with lust and he ends up in prison. That wasn't persecution, that was punishment. That was discipline. That was God saying, hey bro, wake up. Stop sleeping with Delilah. So don't use your situation as in just because you professed Jesus and just because your church attendance is somewhat consistent and your Bible reading plan is somewhat consistent that every bad thing in your life is a result of your Christian faith. Sometimes we make foolish decisions as Christians and we suffer for those foolish decisions and Jesus is not to be blamed nor is our faith to be blamed. Amen. The Bible says the persecution happens for us for righteousness sake, meaning we do something righteous and we get fired or we get ridiculed for godly living, for the kingdom of God as Christians and for Christ. We cannot use every form of attack in our life as, as an excuse that, oh, we're being persecuted. Sometimes it's not persecution. Sometimes it's just pure, simple foolishness that gets rewarded. Number five. We are committed to rejoice when persecuted, avoid retaliation, but we should still stand up for our rights while we have them. Now in my book, Build Fire, I talk about the story of Paul landing on the island of Malta, surviving a shipwreck, a storm, and then building fire, getting bit by a snake, shaking off the snake, and then being used by God. All of that process, when Paul was going through all of that, he was a prisoner. Now, what caught my attention this week about Paul is that Paul bragged about suffering for Jesus. When other apostles talked about their gifts, Paul talked about being beaten, left for dead, imprisonments. But Paul wasn't a punching bag. When you read Paul, you almost think like Paul just went everywhere and said, punch me here, punch me there. He wasn't like that. You see Paul getting arrested in this story where it lasted for a few years and Paul looks to the Roman, Roman centurion. Let me actually read it to you. As they bound him, Paul said to the centurion who stood by, is it lawful for you? Is it lawful for you to scourge a man who is Roman and uncondemned? So Paul is being beat, about to be beaten. He looks at the guy that's doing about to beat him and he's like, uh, did you know that it's not legal for you to do that? And the Roman centurion who honored the law said, wait, that's right. You're a, Roman, you're a Roman citizen. I shouldn't be even binding you. So he releases him, not from the imprisonment, but from being scorched unjustly. Then Paul goes through all these court systems. He notices they're about to take him out. His, his uh, relative hears that they're asking for Paul to be transferred to another place where they can just kill him. Guys decided to fast until they kill Paul. And Paul didn't say, oh yeah, I'm just gonna go in there straight into the ambush and get slaughtered for Jesus, or dying for Jesus. No, Paul reported it to the centurion and then they preserved his life. They sent him to another place. And when he's in another place, they're asking him, would you come to Jerusalem so you can be judged there? He knows in Jerusalem, they'll kill him. He says, nope, absolutely not. I'm going to Caesar. In all of this, being persecuted, Paul is still exercising his right not to die. Why is that important? Because some Christians can develop a persecution complex where they become a punching bag for the culture and the wickedness in their culture and a doormat to say pretty much, oh yeah, we're being persecuted, our building is taken, our rights are taken and we're just, what are we doing? Nothing. We're just rejoicing and we're being persecuted. Fight back! You have rights, while you have them, use them. If you don't use the rights you have, you will have no rights. So if they're not allowing us to go to school, but the alphabet community can run rampant in school and the laws are on our side and we're like, oh yeah, we just got censored. We just got silenced. We got kicked out of schools. Fight for it. Don't hide under, well, I'm being, we're just being persecuted. Paul was being persecuted. He did not let Romans to rip his body apart. He says, is it lawful to do that? And the Roman guy just came back to himself. He's like, oh, no, it's not. He said, then why are you doing it? Do you remember when they beat him in Philippi? And the scripture says that God caused an earthquake and Paul and Silas came out. And the next day, the, the, 
the rulers of that place came to Paul and said, hey, just want to let you know, you're free to go, your case is dismissed. Paul says, absolutely not. He says, you publicly beat us and condemn Roman citizens. You better get your way here and publicly release us, admitting what you did was wrong. Paul says, I'm not going being released in silence when I got mocked publicly. So when you look at that at Paul's life, persecution, yet when he has a right on his side and the law on his side, he uses it to its full extent to fight for his freedom, not for his personal protection, but for the gospel. We as Christians should use the same. And can I just speak frankly to those of us who live in the United States. We still have freedoms. If you don't fight for those freedoms, we will have no freedoms to fight for. If we don't fight for our freedoms, if we don't use our freedoms, if on November you don't vote just because we got two seemingly look like evil people, if you don't use that freedom to fight for more freedom or for the freedom to be protected in this country, we will live in a day where we don't have that freedom. So when for example we went to school and we have our clubs in school, you know you're allowed in the Washington state to have a Bible club you can have a Satan club if you want to. You can have any club that you want. You have the freedom to do that. As long as the student leads it and as long as a teacher gives a classroom. And we're very blessed we have a teacher uh, with us who gives us not only her classroom but her gym in a Kenwick High School. Thank you. So we go to one school on Tuesday and the principal and the other people in charge they said, your, your club is cancelled. Why? Because of the separation of church and state. Which, by the way, anytime you use that phrase, separation of church and state, most people use it wrongly. Separation of the church and state exists so that the state doesn't stick its nose into the church. Not the other way around. The state was, doesn't have the right to control the church. That's what that stands for. Meaning the state keep your hands off of the church. But the church on the other hand can do whatever the church wants. Why? Because Christians are salt. What do you do with salt? You put it where the food is. What do you do with light? You put light where the darkness is. So Christians are called to go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. And the state shouldn't stop that because we're Christians. We're going to live in our society and in our world. And we're going to cause our values, like everybody else causes their values, to influence our environments. So the, the whole idea of, oh, because of the separation of the church and state, you guys cannot be talking about the gospel. Nonsense. The, the early fathers and the, those people who even coined that, that had nothing to do with what you're implying. It simply meant the state, the government, keep your nose out of religion. But you see our government is becoming more and more pagan today. They're not keeping their nose out of religion. So anyway, we go to the school and they're like, you know, separation of church and state. We're like, really? Excuse me, what? So the alphabet community can have their religion. Other people can have their religion and we're helping kids. We're talking about the good news of Jesus. Kids are, are canceling the suicide note and that is wrong? And so instead of just crying about the fact that, oh, we're being persecuted, we went to the superintendent and we told the superintendent, hey, the law is on our side. What you did is discrimination against us. We're Ukrainian. You're discriminating against Ukrainians. How dare you? Russia attacked us. Now you're attacking us. How dare you, cousin of Putin? I mean, we didn't say that. We wanted to say that. When you don't feel like they're uh, discriminating against you because of your faith, you just throw the little minority ethnic thing there and it works like magic with the woke crowd. And so we just simply said, hey, this is just, this is discrimination against us because you're allowing other people to do this. You're not allowing us to do that. Um, we're not here to cause trouble. We're not here to get a new story. We're not here to, to get an article. We just want to impact these kids. We love these kids and the law is on our side and whatever you're doing is wrong. We want to ask you to correct that. Now thankfully the response of the per person in charge of all of those schools was very kind and they were very respectful and they said we're sorry about that we'll look into it and next week our clubs were reinstated if they would have not been reinstated would we just give up that school no 
There are such a things in America and we have more of them than any other nation in the world called lawyers. <laughs> and there is a, such a thing as called court systems. And when one court system doesn't do you well, it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. And last time I heard, there's a lot more conservatives there. What I'm saying is this, being persecuted for Jesus does not mean you develop a martyrdom mentality of becoming a punching bag. When you have freedoms, stand up for yourself. Stand up for the gospel. Don't allow, now when it comes to your family, your family talks bad about you because of your beliefs. Don't hire a lawyer for crying out loud. Jeez, let it go. <laughs> you know, let turn the other cheek. <laughs> let them talk more about you. Don't get all defensive. And that's why I said, do not retaliate. When it comes to personal insults, don't retaliate. Don't make a big deal about it. Develop a thick skin and a baby heart, meaning be kind to people. We're talking about here right now. Paul didn't always, you know, use the law when people would attack him. But there were times when he just applied the law to defend himself. And as Christians, we should do the same. Because some people that I found who are into persecution, they're like, yeah, I'll never speak up. I'm just going to take the beating because everybody else took the beating. I'm like, well, Paul didn't always take the beating. He stood up for himself. And God seemed to honor that. Amen. And the last thing that I would like to share, and that is this. To avoid persecution, all you have to do is compromise and be a coward. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> but that's true. If you're an undercover Christian, a secret Christian, like sometimes, you know, we say, hey, uh, so we haven't seen you in church. Oh, pastor, I am uh, in a secret service Christian. I am undercover. I'm a submarine Christian. I hide. I just live, worship Jesus in my heart. Be very careful because that version of Christianity only exists in someone's world who's afraid. Biblical Christianity is fearless. It's not cocky, arrogant, and reckless, but it's fearless. And it's bold. Amen. When the government shut down churches in the United States because of, of COVID, nobody could gather. And I would understand, nobody knew what was happening with the pandemic at the time. Nobody knew how dangerous this was. And there was a lot of fear. And media did a great job of kind of keeping all of us glued to that. And after about a month, uh, at the time, uh, Donald Trump, announced that the church is essential and within he did that I think on Friday and then on Sunday already about 3,000 churches in the United States gathered together including quite a few attorneys and said we're gonna reopen the church so hungry Jen at the time we were closed for about one month now the government had no problem as long as we live stream and as long as you believe in your heart just don't gather together you know and you just can't be in the public assembly Communists in Russia didn't have a problem with you believing in Jesus in your heart as long as you keep your mouth shut and don't gather together. And that's how a lot of persecution happens everywhere. All you have to do to avoid persecution in many countries is believe in Jesus, just keep it to yourself. Don't tell to your family and don't tell anybody. Keep it to yourself. If you're an underground Christian, meaning if you are a Christian that keeps it to yourself, never tells it to anybody, nobody's going to bother you. So the reason why some of us aren't persecuted, I'm preaching this and it goes over your head, you're like persecuted? What does he think? We're like living in the Middle East? Maybe perhaps you became a complacent Christian or perhaps a cowardly one. And I want to challenge you today not to be a cowardly Christian or to be a private Christian that never talks, shows his faith. So when our church gets shut down, for a month, we decided to reopen it with the permission of our uh, board. I reached out to the local community uh, leaders, particularly the ones, it was really out of um, a need to, in case arrests will come, because I heard pastors getting fined when they were opening. And so I reached out to our chief of police, the state represent, two state representatives, and um, the, um, the mayor, and there was one more person. Send them an email a week before that and said, hey, we're going to reopen this Hungry Gen. I expressed my concerns. I said, uh, Walmart park, parking lot is full. Hiking trails are packed. Casinos are open. 
Black Lives Matter had a million people marching. Nobody did any social distancing. Looting seems to be just fine. Everybody breaking into other stores and nobody says anything about it. And the Bible tells clearly to Christians not to forsake the assembly of each other. And the Bible does not say unless there's a pandemic. Now at first it seemed like, man, but you don't care about the people. They're gonna die if they come to your church. And we warned our people, if you are afraid or if you have underlying issues, please stay home, watch live. This is the shocking part. We reopened the service. Guess the first people that came back to our church. All the elderly people with underlying issues. And we're like, don't come, go home. We're calling the teenagers, we're calling the young adults. And you know what the elderly people told us? We survived Great Depression. We survived Communism. We survived Cuba Crisis. Covid? Really bro? And I remember these people would make fun of me. They're like, really? I was like, you don't understand. You're gonna die. And they're like, and my funeral lot is paid for. And the young adults, the ones who don't have underlying issues, were home sitting with a mask, watching. In, and being indoctrinated by TikTok and CNN and didn't come to church for a year. Our church gets opened by God's grace and all of that time when COVID was running rampant we didn't lose one soul that I'm aware of because of COVID. There was one lady who passed away but she was not even in church. She was battling with cancer. She was given six months to live. She lived for over six years and then when her husband brought that uh, home, um, she eventually passed away. But it wasn't connected to a gathering here. And God not only protected, God grew and multiplied the church. But something happened also to us. Because in reaching out to the local community, this is what I put in PS. When I reached out to them and I said, hey, if you're gonna make arrests this Sunday, here's my personal number. Just text me. I'll come out quietly. We'll only record for social media stories. That's it. It won't take a lot of footage. You can lock me up in jail. We already have two lawyers on standby. I'll get released next day. The lawyers will hush everything out. I'm like, just don't make a scene. Because people in our church do carry. And we don't want trouble. I know they believe in God. And I know they believe in the power of God. Some of them believe in also few other powers. That they hide very beautifully in their, in their garments. And I was like, this is America. Like just. Just let's not cause any trouble. Just lock me up and just, I'll just get released next day. Every single one of the city officials, some of them asked me not to mention that during the COVID time. Now I can mention it. But they said, what? Who's going to lock you up? Dude. One of them responded back, finally somebody with, and I'm not going to mention what he said. He said, dude, you go have the church. Relax, bro. Nobody's going to arrest you. Nobody's, nobody's going to take care of that. What I want to let you know is all of our fears, if we take a stand for Jesus, are nothing usually but false evidence appearing real. Where cowardness, oh they'll reject me, they'll kill me, really? What you don't realize is they've been praying for somebody to talk to them about Jesus. All of these fears, if I tell my friend in school about the Lord Jesus Christ, oh, he will never be my friend. What if he's actually planning to end his life that night and you're gonna save him? And not only that, you're gonna gain the best friend for the rest of your life. Don't allow fear to hold you back. Don't allow cowardness, compromise to hold you back. The fear of oh, what they're gonna do to me. Jesus says, don't fear them if they can kill the body. Fear Him who can kill the body and the soul. But many times the fears are unjustified. They're simply made up demonic fantasies in our heads that people will do this and people will do and they will do nothing. God will step in and show a miracle. Amen. One person, and I heard this story also from people that were persecuted. They were executing three Christian brothers. And they had three of these Christian, it was a psychological also warfare because they made them dig their graves first. Which is pretty emotional when you're digging your own grave. You're kind of realizing, hey, this is where I'm going to die. And so this, they were already in prison camps and they finished digging their graves. And then they brought them one by one. They kept them in the house. They couldn't see what was happening. They brought first person and they said, deny Jesus and you will live. If you don't deny Jesus, 
well, you dug your grave, you're going to get shot. I'm going to give you a chance. You have one till three. One, two, three. And he says, absolutely not. I'm not denying Jesus. So they shoot, you know, a blank into the air. And they ask him to cover his grave. He covers his grave and walks to a different building. They bring his second friend and they said, you just heard the shot. That was your friend. He's dead. That's his grave. Do you see the fresh dirt? That's his grave. Think about your family. You have a wife and you have children. What kind of a father? What kind of a husband do you think you will be? Following this Jesus, when you're turning your back on your family, all you got to do is deny Jesus. And you can be reunited with your family. And he says, my true family, they'll join me. Jesus is my savior. I ain't denying Jesus for absolutely nothing. And he says, and my friend, the one that just died, I'm going to see him in just a second. Go ahead, pull the trigger. They did exactly the same thing. They, you know, released the shot, but they didn't shoot him. They said, cover your grave. They, he covered his grave, walked away. The third guy comes in and they use the same psychological manipulation. You know, the whole family thing, you know, what kind of a dad are you going to be? And they really manipulate you first because it's, it's, a, it's a manipulation. And look at two of your friends. You want to be like that? You know, your kids will grow up orphans. And he says, okay, I'll give in. I'll deny Jesus. And they shot him. And they put him in the grave. And the last thing this man did is cowardly thing. Is he denied Jesus. Now this is one of the stories that I've heard from pastors who went through this and he says that that story is true. And that to me reminds me that if I live as a coward, the price of cowardness is way higher than the price, price for courage. You know, we think of the well disciples of Jesus, oh, they died such a bad death. But there was a coward that died a death before that. His name was Judas. He didn't die a normal death. He hanged himself. So it seems like I'll either die as a courageous follower of Jesus. I will live for him. And if need to be die for him, or I'm going to die as a coward. I don't want to die as a coward. I want to live committed to Jesus and die as a person that loved Jesus and never denied Jesus. I'm going to share with you a story. I included this in the first chapter of the book. Philip Sinyuk was born in 1899 in Western Ukraine. In his youth, he came to know Jesus. He later got married and had six children. In 1940s, when the Nazis came to occupy his homeland, he was faced with a decision to run and hide in the woods or to stay in the village where he lived. Through a prophetic word, the Lord told him, whatever he does, whether he hides in the woods or lives in the village, God will protect him. So he decided to stay in the village. Nazis came. Nazis didn't care what faith you had as long as you stayed out of their way. No problem. Nazis left. After that, Soviets came in and started to harass Christians for believing in God. They interrupted church meetings and arrested and fined believers. One day during a church service where Philip was preaching, a Soviet agent came up to him and put a gun to his back and led him off the stage in front of the church. Philip was arrested and sentenced to 10 years in prison. The charges were preaching the gospel and refusing to join the Communist Party because Soviets viewed Protestants as foreign Western agents and traitors to the regime. Leaving his wife and six children behind, Philip spent years behind bars. During those years, his wife would send gifts of crackers and flour to the prison. Philip would share those crackers with other prisoners and put the flour in his bowl of soup since the only base the soup had was water. Philip was locked up for five years and was released early. However, the hostility toward Christians did not stop. One day, Philip was walking down the street with his close friend, Gnut. Some Soviet officials in the village were riding in the horse-driven carriage. They approached Philip and Gnut and persuaded him to get on the carriage. The next thing they knew is the same man in that carriage started to beat Philip and Gnut while the horse was going along. Gnat managed to jump out and run into the fields. Philip, while jumping to escape, got his foot stuck in between wooden planks of the carriage. 
Instead of stopping the horse to help him get his foot loose, they kept going while his body and head were bouncing on the road. The horse and carriage dragged him for a long time while local field workers watched from a distance. They kept giving him lashes as he was helplessly dragged on the road. After a while they stopped and dropped him off at the nearby hospital. Philip suffered a concussion and many other injuries to his head and the body because of this mistreatment. Due to the seriousness of the injuries, the hospital personnel had to report this case to the highest authority who opened an investigation. However, the field workers who witnessed the abuse were threatened to be silent. Philip refused to press charges and forgave them, giving them into the hands of God. Five years later, in 1964, Philip died at the age of 65. Philip is my great-grandfather, who told me this story is my grandma, who was one of his daughters, who's part of our church. She was here in the first service. She was his daughter. And she recounted some of these memories to me of living in that kind of a world. I want to invite you today to commit your life to Jesus in such a way that if persecution comes, you stand tall. You don't give in, you don't give up, and you don't quit. And if you can use your rights to defend yourself, use all of them, not only for defense of yourself, but of the gospel. For those of you going back to school, if you are mocked for your faith, let them mock you. But live your faith out loud, full of love, full of truth, and full of the Holy Spirit. If you became a Christian and your family misunderstood you and they called you with names, they slandered maybe you. And you kind of feel a little bit reserved and ashamed. You feel all alone. I want to tell you, you are not alone. People before you have went through this, people have died, people have given their life and I want to tell you that you have a church and you have the body of Christ, you have small groups who are walking beside you and I want to say soldier, cheer on because our King is coming back. The scripture says that God will tell people who overcome that I am going to be their God in Revelation and they will be my sons my children and then it says after that but all the cowardly people the liars and the fornicators will have their place in the lake of fire i am not gonna be part of the cowardly ones i want to be courageous committed follower of jesus christ who died on the cross for my sin who was buried in that grave and three days later he rose from that death and not only that he started this movement called christian faith and he is coming back for the church he's coming back for a militant church glorious church pure church humble church and courageous church until he comes we will do business. What is that business? Business, we will win souls and make disciples. We will experience persecution. People will not understand us and they will call us with names. People will criticize us and people will undermine us and they will do all of that. Some people will even try to threaten us. Come hell high water. Jesus said, the church I built, the gates of hell will not prevail against. The church will march on. Communists will stop, fascists, Nazis, all of the other isms, they will come and they will go. But Jesus says, my church will not be stopped. You're part of that church. And make no mistake, we're not snowflakes, spineless people. We are soldiers, not strong because we're courageous, but strong because God is in us. And we will live out our faith boldly. Everyone came out of the closet. Everyone did. Nobody's in closets anymore. It's time for us to come out of ours as well. Perversion came out of the closet. Confusion came out of the closet. Identity crises came out of the closet. 
What if holiness, righteousness, good family, raising up godly children, what about good morals, what about Christ crucified, Jesus coming back, let that news come out of the closet. We have spent time in a secret place but I want to challenge you today to be the light in this world, be the salt in this world, let people hate you, let them not like you. I'm not saying to attract that, I'm not saying to be a wrecking ball that just attracts drama, I'm saying that when it comes don't be discouraged by it keep on going keep on serving Jesus and one day you might live to see the very critics of your faith become the friends and who will join you and be with you and be like Saul who says I persecuted Christians and now I am part of them